Hi everyone, we're on the show floor at Info Security Europe. We have a panel of experts here assembled today to discuss state-sponsored cyber activity and the legal frameworks that govern it, or don't perhaps. With us we have uh, Professor David Supple, City University London, uh, Eric Sands, CTO of Secure Anchor, and a SAN certified instructor, and Peter Wood of ISACA's London chapter and founder of First Base Technologies. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. You're welcome. Good to be here, Dirk. Oh, excellent. So, first question out of the gate. What type of activities are certain countries engaging in in cyberspace? Uh, it, does it depend which nation we're talking about? I'll start with you, Peter. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, the feedback we're getting is that uh, they're certainly engaging in it on a very regular basis. Um, we've seen evidence in the commercial sector as well as the the government sector. Um, I think attribution is a little more of a, a dangerous place to be, but uh, uh, our friends in government are telling us the Chinese are very active, the Iranians are very active, and uh, maybe the Russians slightly less so. Um, friendly nations, not so sure. And Eric, does it, does it depend who, which country as to which type of activity they're engaging in in cyberspace? What are, the, what are they taking? Let's say, for example, China versus the United States. In terms of the information they're targeting, it's quite different, whether it's military or government or commercial type technology. But the interesting thing we're finding is because the internet has no international boundaries, everyone's playing in this game. And what they're really doing is they're targeting individuals. They're looking for individuals that they can go in, take over their system, set up pivot points and have long-term access. Because if you have long-term access, you can do anything you want on that network. So a lot of the goals is the information is secondary. It's the control of those networks to be able to monitor and gain access to anything they're doing that is really the high level goal of most of these countries. Yeah, many of the uh, countries around um, the world are practicing cyber warfare from an offensive point of view. Um, they haven't really used it in, in earnest yet. Um, but they could. The, Amer the Russians used it, of course, in Georgia and, and Estonia, um, where they had a, a denial of service. Um, but most of the countries in the state area are involved in espionage and um, intelligence gathering. Espionage from the point of view of gathering intellectual property, and China would be doing that. Um, and um, other countries, it's intelligence gathering. It's a cheap way of doing it. Right. Uh, this week, the Verizon uh, research team released their latest data breach investigation report. Uh, the second most prevalent uh, form of data breaches occurred in the, what they called, let me get this, state-affiliated espionage realm. Mm -hmm. um, so how pervasive is this issue? I think it's a lot more pervasive than the average Joe will believe. Mm -hmm. um, interesting that, uh, as Eric said, there's a, a big focus on theft of IP in the long-term penetration techniques. We're seeing um, social engineering on many fronts, particularly through uh, boring stuff like phishing attacks. Um, the, the success of these initial entry points seems to be dependent on the human factor, but the persistent nature of these attacks is sufficiently subtle that most organizations aren't aware that they've been penetrated, aren't aware that the exfiltration of data is going on over many months or even years. And certainly from, from our perspective, running tests for clients to try and determine where they're vulnerable as if we were the attacker, the, the, the key points seem to be, first of all, as I said, the social engineering vulnerabilities. Second of all, the poor quality and nature of authentication credentials, which means it's surprisingly and, and, and uh, quite easy and, and indeed I'd say very easy to impersonate a legitimate user and the majority of organizations we've looked at really don't have any sort of detection techniques yet that allow them to, to determine this behaviorally. They, they have good systems to look for unauthenticated attacks, but very poor systems to detect you know, real credentials being abused. So I think most organizations really aren't aware of what's going on actually in their networks because the nature of the attacks are, are of that sort with legitimate credentials that, as you say, using a pivot point to gain access and escalate privilege, again, frequently through something as, as feeble as poor quality passwords. And so 
So how pervasive do you think it is, Eric? Is this something that everybody with the capability is doing? It's extremely pervasive. The problem is, building on what my colleague said, is no one's detecting it. That's the part of the Verizon threat report that I find so interesting, is less than 20% of organizations are actually detecting attacks that are out there. So most organizations put their energy and effort on prevention, which worked 10 years ago, but today the attacks are so stealthy, you're not gonna be able to prevent them. You have to accept the fact you're gonna be compromised and you have to focus on detection. So I think the problem's a lot worse than most organizations think because they look out there, everything looks fine, but underneath the surface, they're losing lots and lots of information and the other interesting point is not only that organizations aren't detecting it, but the way that most organizations know they're compromised, third party notification. That's scary. I joke in the United States that most organizations IDS is the FBI. They wait for the Federal Bureau of Investigations to call them and that's how they detect attacks and take action. They are doing a terrible job in house and that's why this continues to get worse and worse. David, we recently had the Mandiant Report, um, the latest in a long line that points a finger at China as being the most frequent transgressor of such activity. Um, is that a fair rap, or is really, is everybody doing this, or is China engaging more frequently in different types of espionage? I think China is, is engaging um, in a substantial way. I, I wouldn't like to say that they're being uh, specifically uh, um, fingered for um, the, the most uh, pervasive in the world. Um, but you have to understand that China is a nation which is, um, uh, uh, has a, an emerging economy, very, very quickly uh, emerging as well. And so therefore they require a great deal of uh, intellectual property to be able to build their industry up quickly. And just to give you one example of this, the, in the pharmaceutical industry, to develop a molecule for a new drug might cost several billion dollars. Um, this information, if they can get hold of the molecule information, plus the information on the clinical trials, they could get the drug to market quicker. So this is really, really um, a profitable way of, uh, of working. So are they doing it? I believe they are. Right. And I don't know if either of you two gentlemen agree, but let's say the Americans and the British, they're not out there stealing intellectual property, but they're certainly out in cyberspace gathering intelligence and information when we're talking about the governments, the militaries. One of the things I found is, in the real world, there are allies. In cyberspace, there's no allies. Mm -hmm. It's every country for themselves. Because if you go and take any country, and you look at who's doing cyber espionage, spying, breaking in, on that list of top 10, of course, you'll have the usual suspects. You'll also have all their allies listed there. So I think it's important to remember that on the internet, people play by different roles and everyone's trying to get whatever information they can. And going back to China, I think the important point is China is definitely not innocent, but there's many other countries that are not innocent either that are sort of below the radar and not getting as much credit. But yes, everyone's playing in this game. <laughs> Definitely. Nothing to add to that, except you're right. I don't think much has changed since the years of the Cold War, really. And, you know, just because there are ideological differences, um, that, that seems to underpin the perspective of why the espionage would take place. But you're quite right, there's commercial drivers here as, as well. In fact, probably larger these days. And that means everybody's, uh, everybody's on the playing field, definitely. And then when we talk about motivation, we have attacks that are destructive in nature, and those that are meant to gather information. Uh, and there's a fundamental difference. So when we talk about legal frameworks, um, perhaps we might want to establish one that would govern the destructive nature ones, and the espionage ones, well, those may always persist. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about Stuxnet, for example, yeah. okay? Let's, say, let's assume that the Americans and perhaps the Israelis were responsible for that. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a fundamental difference that needs to make a distinction between these two types of activities, legally speaking, on an international stage? Do you, do you think that this is something that needs to be addressed? So we're talking like a, a Geneva Convention in cyberspace, that sort of thing. Exactly, you... something that avoids widespread destruction, um, you know, the um, adverse effects to, to everyday human life. 
and yeah. not just the gathering of intelligence information? Well, idealistically, yes, definitely, of course. Um, is that likely to, I, I, if I'm honest, I think there's the decision makers and the rule makers possibly have quite a significant minority that actually understand the question. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing I've learned in 45 years of IT is that those of us that are involved in it and embedded in it day to day really don't understand how big a disconnect there is for everybody else. And, and I think that's particularly true at a government level. Sorry, governments. But, uh, you know, I'm not sure that the, the world is mature enough to understand the question yet. Right. David, how about you? I think that I, I can't add too much to that because I don't think the world is mature enough. But the, the um, and certainly in the, um, just to take Stuxnet, for instance, um, I, I think Stuxnet was probably sponsored because the software itself uh, was actually quite amateurish, amateurish. To develop it cost a lot of money. So um, I think it was sponsored. Um, can we legislate? Very difficult. Because the, the, the one thing about the internet and, and the, was it has no boundaries, and you've mentioned that. Uh, if we're to legislate, we're gonna have to put boundaries on it uh, and state borders. Uh, I don't understand how that's gonna happen right. or whether it ever will. I think the other challenge is defining that word destruction. Because I think most people, when you say destruction, think physical destruction or loss of life. Mm -hmm. However, cyber destruction can be just as devastating. If somebody goes in, back to my colleague's comment, and steals research that you've invested a billion dollars in, beat you to market, and they go in and your company loses $3 billion and goes out of business, that's destruction, but people don't view it the same way. They don't understand that stealing ones and zeros can be just as devastating and cause harm as physical destruction. So I think we have to be careful when you're trying to distinguish physical and cyber because the damage and impact to companies can actually be a lot worse on the cyber side. Right, right. And should we ex just accept that on an espionage level that this sort of thing will just happen? That this is the same old cat and mouse game that existed? For example, when you were saying back in the Cold War. Oh, yeah. Well, just with different tools, basically. Yeah, unquestionably. I, I don't see that changing. I don't see any motivation for that changing. Mm -hmm. Governments will continue to want to take that approach to, to, to further the nation state's agenda. Mm -hmm. So, no, I, I, I don't see that. I see it increasing, not decreasing. Um, I don't see any legislation ever having any, any real effect on it. So, yeah, unquestionably. With our dependence on the internet, what I always say is the sun will rise, the sun will set, and your data will be stolen. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'd just like to say that the, um, with the internet itself, we, we have established something which is open, let's keep it open, uh, and then deal with the cyber crime. But the thing about it is that the, uh, I call it the cyber crime, the dark side, they're clever guys, um, and they have a lot of resources, and they've got economy of scale. Uh, to keep up with them is going to be very difficult. Um, right. We're just about managing to do that at the moment. But I find a lot of companies uh, haven't taken the necessary uh, precautions to stop even the simplest uh, attacks. Hmm. And, and that's, that's my worry. Right. Now, what about the role of cyber espionage in warfare? I don't want to throw out the term cyber warfare. Uh, hmm. I, I'm not particularly fond of it. I don't know about the rest of you um, because that sort of conduct is just a part of warfare in general and probably will be going into the future. Intelligence gathering always will be. Um, but we had the Talinan Manual uh, published by, uh, it was written by NATO experts. Um, David, can you tell us, I know you've read some of it, uh, what types of distinctions does it make and what types of activities does it lay out a groundwork for in rulemaking? The, the basic thing is it, it's trying to, to establish the rules of engagement. Um, and uh, in warfare, we've, we, we've ha we have rules of engagement, not necessarily written and uh, in carved in stone or whatever, but, uh, but, it, but they are written. Uh, in the cyber, cyber space, this hasn't been the case. What the Tallinn document started to do was, was establish this, this rules of engagement, mainly for cyber warfare. Uh, and um, I, I think it set down the start of a good framework. But it comes back to the point that you raised earlier the internet is an open with no borders. Uh, the rules of engagement are based on the fact that countries have borders. 
Uh, and I think with the internet, with no, rule, no borders, this is going to be very difficult. I think the important thing is, most of us when we think warfare, we think starting in any points, World War I, World War II, where there's adversaries and fighting. What we have to recognize is we're at warfare right now. Cyber warfare is just a way of life. It's going to continue, it's not going to stop, and it's just something we have to accept and deal with. And the part that makes it hard is with traditional warfare, it's mainly the militaries that are involved. Once in a while, commercial organizations or civilians could be casualties, but they are not active players. In cyber warfare, commercial organizations are active players. Not only are they being targeted, but in many cases, they're actively involved in it. A lot of the stuff we're seeing coming from foreign countries aren't the government. It's competitors, adversaries, and other folks. So it's really a whole new set of rules. And I don't even like the word warfare because it's so significantly different. But we are constantly in attack, defend, and everyone connected to the internet has to be thinking both offensive and defensively if they want to survive. Yeah, I agree completely. I think, you know, we were talking yesterday with some some guys who are over at the B-Sides conference. And um, as I said to you earlier, I think, um, you know, what happened in the, the 50s and 60s, which became known as the Cold War, really didn't go away just because the Berlin Wall came down. It, it's just the players changed. And now, uh, significantly in the last 10 years, the mechanisms have changed because it's, it's internet-based and it's connectivity-based and it's, and it's virtualized. But the, the, the basic human nature of competitive ideologies, competitive commercial organizations ain't going to change. The players might change, but the, 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 the nature of, of, of this adversarial environment is just going to get uh, bigger, I think. Right. And we'll talk about how this cyber component does change um, these types of attacks. You mentioned the borderless um, aspects of it. In a conventional war, let's say, we know who fired this gun, who shot this bomb off, but when we're doing this sort of state-sponsored cyber activity, attribution really becomes the issue. Eric, yeah. yeah that's one of the uh, big things we're struggling with because right now we have seen cases where there have been physical acts of aversion that have been followed up with cyber-based attacks. We've seen that with Russia and other cases. What we're waiting to see is the opposite. Is there ever a situation where if somebody launches a cyber attack, you can then use physical aversion against them? And the challenge we always have there is how do you know who it is? And one of the things I always correct people when they go and say all these attacks are coming from China. Now, please don't get me wrong. A lot are. But remember, relay points. Most attackers don't directly break into you. And one of the things that China did five to 10 years ago, which I thought was brilliant, is they created a lot of open, vulnerable systems. And everybody knew that if you wanted to re have relay points, China was the place to go. And the reason why that was an interesting move on their part is because now when they're attacking other people and everyone traces it back and says, stop that, China says, hey, it wasn't us. Somebody's relaying off our system. You know we've had vulnerable boxes. And now all of a sudden it gets so much more interesting. And then the question is, if a country doesn't lock down their ISP and they're used as a relay, do they have the right to be attacked with physical warfare if attacks come and are devastating? And what I think is going to happen in the next 12 to 18 months is you're going to see massive cyber attacks take down critical infrastructure of a country, and they're going to retaliate with physical warfare, and then attribution is going to be the top of the line question of whether that was justified or not. David, how does, there was a very, how does attribution complicate There was a very us? good, good uh, um, example recently with yeah. the attack on South Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone says, ah, the attack came from China. Uh, I can't find any evidence of that at all. And the North Koreans are quite capable of doing the attack themselves. Um, and, and more importantly, how do you target six or seven basic systems exactly at the same time through a cyber attack? Uh, without having some software already in the system uh, which you're going to trigger because uh, and I, I believe that that software has been in the South Korean systems for some time mm -hmm. uh, so was it China I have no idea right. <laughs> probably <laughs> one last question one short and sweet one I guess we in the West like to blame Iran 
blame the Russians, blame the Chinese, the list goes on. We don't like to blame ourselves usually. So do we blame them or is it everyone? Oh, it's everyone, isn't it? Yeah, yeah I think, of course, we like to, to, to stand by our ideological principles and the age-old enemies and the axis of evil and all that good stuff. And that, as, as Eric and, and David have both said a number of times, that doesn't mean that's not correct, but it's by no means the whole picture, and, and it never will be. And, you know, this, this issue of attribution is, is the biggest challenge, surely, in a TCPIP environment. You can never say where it came from. Or everybody who's capable, are they guilty? Uh, absolutely. And what's interesting is in real physical warfare, larger countries have an advantage. Small countries don't have as much money. They don't necessarily have the same military and training. Cyber warfare levels the playing field. Anybody can play in this game. You can literally have 10 people in a country, and you could be just as effective in cyber warfare as a billion dollar organization. And in some cases, the larger the country, the more vulnerable because of the more egress points. So yes, it's absolutely everybody. We like blaming the bigger names because it's more believable, but we have to recognize that when you go in, and one of the interesting things we do with our clients, just go and use any SIM or correlation tool Look at where all your packets are coming from and geoplot the source IP address, and you will see that you're getting attacks from every possible country out there. Everyone's playing in this game. Some are just better at hiding it than others. All right. The final word goes to you, David. I just think that uh, during the Cold War, um, America and Russia had uh, an agreed uh, s uh, state between the two countries called mutually assured destruction, uh, MAD. In the cyber war game, they're going to have exactly the same thing, but every country is going to be part of MAD. Mm -hmm. So they're all going to have mutually assured destruction, so they all must get good at it. Where's Dr. Strangelove when you need him, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, gentlemen, I want to thank you for coming up onto the stage and for joining me for this conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Drew. Our pleasure. Yeah, thank thanks you. for that. Thank pleasure you. to be here.